Hey everyone, welcome back to another Common UI tutorial. In this video, I'm gonna be going over the enhanced input actions. I'm gonna walk you through the setup and how to get all of that situated, as well as a couple of example widgets to where we're going to enable the enhanced input actions. And then we're also going to showcase how to show icons and make all of that work within enhanced input actions. And then we're also going to dive into how to make the input actions work within a player character and a player controller and have that interact with the UI. Now in this video, some things may not be the best way to do things uh, because trying to go about doing a much larger thing would take a bit longer, but it does showcase how you can go through communicating and getting that to work. Uh, so just try to listen to my explanations and I, I do cover it. And yeah, if you are interested in a shorter version of this, there is in fact a much shorter version that just goes through the setup and then jumps straight into the demo. It's only about 35 minutes while this one is about 75 minutes. So that will be in the description if you wanna view that instead. And I also wanna give a really special shout out to Arthur who is the first person to join my membership since I have now gotten that functionality from YouTube. And I really appreciate you, man. Thanks for being the first. Now let's get into the video. So first things first, what we have to do is we need to now enable common UI. So we'll go into edit plugins. You just type in common, we'll get here. And then it will tell you that it is the beta version. We'll hit yes. And then you're gonna then hit that restart. And now that we have added in the plugin, we need to now go into the project settings. So we're gonna edit project settings. There's a few things that we need to do and then we're gonna have to restart the editor once more. So let's go into common input settings. What we want to do is we need to enable enhanced input support. So this is what's gonna allow us to use that enhanced input actions for common UI. Um, as you can see, it's trying to prompt me to do that. We're just gonna do later and then allow out of focus device input. Uh, so this is for devices that are obviously not focused right now. Uh, we're still gonna allow them to get input in and then from here, the input data, what we need to do is we need to now create our own. As of right now, it's just gonna go into the generic one, uh, but we wanna create our own. Sometimes this button works, other times it doesn't. As of right now, it doesn't look like it's working. So what you can do is I'm gonna go into these pre-made folders that I've already created. We're gonna do blueprint class, just search input data. And you wanna select the common UI input data. You don't really need to do the generic one, you can. Uh, but there's really no purpose. And we're just gonna call this input data. I'm not gonna really be creative with this. And then if we actually open this up, I hate when it opens the graph like that. So let's go ahead and try that one more time. All right, as of right now, we don't really have anything to enter. These are just the default data table ones, but we don't wanna use that right now. So we're gonna save that for a later time. Okay, and then now what we need to do is we need to go into changing the viewport. So it's under default classes, general settings, game viewport, client class. We're gonna change this into common game viewport point. And then with that, let's go back into our common input settings. What we want to do is we need to set up our controller data. Now I've already made controller data set up for me already. Uh, but what you can do, if you haven't done it already, let's go ahead and go here. What we're gonna do is now hit that plus button once more, still not working. If we go into it, type controller data, you'll then see the common input base controller data. By creating this, I'm not gonna give it a name because I'm gonna delete it in a second. Once more, the graph is opening and I hate that. From here, you are prompted this. Now you are able to pick what type of input type. So with this, you have mouse, keyboard, gamepad, touch and count. And then you'll have to set up the input brush data map. From here, what it does is it tells you what key to press. So I'm gonna press Q. And then from there, you then have to specify what image to use. So I don't think I have a Q image. No, I don't, uh, but let's just say that's like the queue image. And then you would have to set that up. So for the mouse and keyboard, it's going to be using this button 
uh, queue. And then whenever it's using Q, it's gonna populate that image. You know, that's really important if you're trying to showcase any type of icons for your UI. Now for gamepad, also bear in mind that when you switch to gamepad, you also have these options to select. So by default, Unreal Engine will show generic. And then from here, just also make sure that you put the platform name as Windows or whatever the respective platform is. Now I'm not going in how to set up controllers themselves, but just also make sure to set it up as such, as generic, like that. And then you would go through and then you would just want to then set up every single button. So like, let's say this is a D-pad up and then you put an image for that and you so forth. So that's how you'd set that up. I've already set up my own with my gamepad as such. So I have the PlayStation icons and I'm using the button down and then I have the left top, right trigger, all of those other buttons and a total of eight keys right now. And then with my PC, I also have roughly about, uh, about 14 keys entered in. So since I have these set up, we're gonna go into the project settings again under Windows and then the controller data, I'm going to select the two things that I have created, so gamepad and keyboard. One thing to note is that sometimes when your keyboard is the default and they start with gamepad or something, or gamepad is connected, the icons may not show. So one tip that I saw ages ago that I don't even remember what it is, is to set the default input type to gamepad. So if you have a mouse and keyboard with gamepad options uh, to set the gamepad as the default one. And then also make sure to change the def default gamepad name to generic, because that is what we set up within the PC gamepad. And then that way you'll get the icons to show up. So I'm going ahead and leave it there. And now we're going to restart this. Let's actually delete that thing. And then now let's go ahead and restart. Okay, now that we have all the settings set up, we now wanna move on to the input actions. So you do have to set up input actions a certain way if you want them to work with your common UI. Uh, so there's a few steps we have to go through. So we're gonna kind of start from scratch and then we're just gonna explain it as we go along. Uh, so I'm gonna go into my pre-made folders here and then CUI is where I'm gonna put in the input actions and the mapping contents. So from here, we're gonna create an input action like we normally would, input action. And I'm gonna do IA, and then in the documentation, Unreal Engine or Epic Games, whatever you wanna refer to them as, um, specifies to use UI. So we go IA, UI, and then we specify the name. So then we're gonna do select. So we're gonna go ahead and make one first, and then we're gonna make a few others. So from here, we're gonna then create a player mappable key settings. Uh, so this is important in order to get all of the information to populate. And there's a few things that we need to do. So we're gonna go ahead and also put accept here. And then also if you are using a common action widget, uh, so this is when you are wanting to use a specific button that will show text of an action, you need to fill out the action description as well. So whatever is specified here is what gets populated into that common action button widget. We're not covering that in this video. However, I will have another video that goes over um, where we utilize that field, but just keep in mind that that is quite an important field later on. Next, what we need to do is we're gonna need to create a metadata. So with the metadata, that is how we're gonna specify that it's gonna be used for common UI. So we're gonna go ahead, create a new folder here. We're gonna call this metadata into here. We then need a data asset or data asset, however you wanna pronounce it really. And we need the common mapping context metadata. Go ahead and select that. We're gonna do DA for data asset. And we're just gonna do generic CUI. So generic common UI, nothing fancy. And then we open this up. We're now given two options. The first option 
is a drop down with one single option. We're just going to want to select that. So by selecting this, we then get another drop down. So this is a nav bar priority. So this is the priority of the input meta data. So pretty much the lower the number, higher priority it's going to be. Um, Use at your own discretion. Unreal Engine does actually, I think in their example, they use like 10. Uh, make sure to use whatever best fits for you. If you want to have these as the lowest priority, then you probably want to set it to something like 10. Uh, if you want these input actions to have a higher priority, then you'll want to decrease that number. Just go ahead and select as such. And is generic input action should be turned on. If it is not turned on, um, then you won't get the input actions to work with the buttons. If they are turned off, it will send that input action to the player controller. Uh, so depending on where you want to use it is where you decide through selecting, is this a generic input action or not? We'll kind of get into that a bit more later. So from here, we're going to go ahead and add in the one that we've used. So we're going to go ahead and select the UI accept. We're also going to then select common input metadata. And from here, you get the same exact options. So this is where you can then select, is this one going to be a generic input action or not? This top one should always be turned on. You don't need to touch that. But for any input action that we select here, that is where you can select whether it should or should not. So I'm going to go ahead and just do 10 anyways, just because that's what the documentation said. Uh, but the priority really just depends on what you're using. Actually, I can just have it all at zero because it doesn't really matter for me. And then from here, you actually can add in other input actions. What you can also do is that if you were creating a wide variety of different type of UI functionalities, or maybe you have some that are going to be utilized for, uh, let's say you want for mouse keyboard to have its own, gamepad to have its own, or maybe you want PlayStation to have its own, and then Xbox to have its own, things like that. You can go ahead and create your own, uh, like another one, you could do like generic PS5 or whatever, and then when you open it up, you can then change the settings to what you want to use for it. So if you have multiple different type of inputs that maybe they don't apply to both, you can go ahead and do that. You can also just use general uh, multiple different types if you're just doing some complex things. I don't know, come up with the ideas, but you do have the ability to do so. But with that, we're actually gonna want to create a few other type of input actions so that we can have a wide range of options. So we're gonna go ahead back into our CUI. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this a few times. We're gonna do, let's see, we're gonna change this to the back button. So this is going to be like the uh, backspace or the circle button on a PlayStation controller. I don't own an Xbox, so I'm not really sure what's on the Xbox, but it's the right face button. And then we're going to then do a tab left because we are going to be using a tab list and showcase how that's going to work. We're also going to do a tab right because if you do the left, you got to do the right. And then we're also going to do a open. Uh, this one is going to be opening up a widget to a stack on the use of a button. And then from there, we're actually going to create a, another option. We're going to call this print. And then we're going to call this close. So I do have a pop up, which I'll show you guys soon. But we're going to have all of these options. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we could set up this one one more time, and then I'm going to set up all the others. So we're going to go ahead and go through. We want this as metadata. I could have searched it, but it's fine. And I'm going to go ahead and copy this, paste, and paste. And like that, we've set up another one. It's very simple. Now that we've created the meta metadata, we're going to be able to add all of them pretty quickly. And then also under the metadata, we're also going to go into here. And then we're also going to select back one more time. And like so, we have all of that. Now I'm going to do all of the inputs right now, and we'll be right back. All right now we have all of them added in. 
I did the same thing on all of them, just repeated what I did with the accept in the back button. So now that we got this set up, we're now going to create our mapping context. So we're gonna go ahead back over here and we're just gonna do input, that should be enough. Then we want the input mapping context, IMC. We're just gonna do UI generic. And then from here, we now need to add in all of our inputs. So we're gonna go ahead and do that as well. It's gonna be another kind of long process. We're gonna go ahead and just select all of these. As such, we're gonna have the tab left, the tab right. We're gonna have also the, let's see, the open, close, and we're also going to do the print. Uh, so we're going to focus on these ones first. The bottom three will kind of go into what the purpose is for in a bit. But for this, uh, for the accept button, I'm going to do the enter button. So for my keyboard, we're going to go ahead and use that. And then I'm also going to be using the face down button for the gamepad. Or not face button bottom, sorry. So that's kind of the accept button there. For the back button, we're gonna be using the backspace. And then we're gonna do one more. And then we're also going to do the left. So that sets that up. We'll go ahead and do that. And then for the tab left, we're going to do the one key. And tab right's gonna be the two key. And then for gamepad, we're gonna be doing the shoulders. So left is gonna be the left shoulder. And then we're gonna do the right shoulder. Okay, perfect. So with that, we have those set up. One thing I do want to clarify is you do need a mouse key and a gamepad key if you want icons to appear. So there is a Kind of weird thing if you don't have both keys right now. Uh, so that is something I ran into as well as a few others that I've talked about on the internet. Internet, I don't know why I stumbled on that, but if there is only a gamepad key, there can be issues with enhanced input action like icons and flipping back and forth. Uh, so just keep in mind, if you don't include a key, just, try to enter in a key and see if that fixes the problem. Um, for the backspace and the enter key specifically, uh, I did have to add in a mouse key, uh, but for like tab left, tab right, um, things like that, I was able to leave off the keyboard key and it did work correct. It just seems for these two specifically, it does require a mouse key. So just bear in mind for that. For the accept button, you can also just do like the mouse click button and you could just move forward with that. Uh, it won't actually ever go through as well, by the way, because that's your mouse click button. Uh, so just also bear in mind on that as well. So if you're just trying to enter in a key for no reason, uh, you could use the mouse key. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and set up the open, the close, and the print button as well. So give me one moment. All right, so I set the keys for those. I set the right trigger for three and then the other two face buttons for uh, four and five. I also just moved print above. So those are gonna be th specific things that I'm gonna be using just to showcase some extra functionality. It's why I'm not really going too in depth with this. But you'll also notice I actually didn't do anything specific with the triggers or the modifiers because I have set these all to a bool. So there's just like a true or false. There's nothing specific going on with that. If you're looking to do things with like triggers and modifiers, uh, go ahead and figure out on your own choosing. I am not using that for UI. So just bear in mind as well. So with that, we've now set up our input mapping context. We also have the, the metadata. So we're gonna go ahead and close this off. So what I'm gonna use for this project is under the project settings, I'm gonna go into input 
here, and then we're gonna add in a default mapping context, and that's where I'm gonna add the UI generic. Now make sure to use this at your own risk as it will automatically add this in. You don't have to do that, you can do the other way of just adding it to the player controller. Uh, make sure you, you are utilizing what you believe is best. And then next, we're gonna go into the input data. We're gonna then select that click button that we've made, which is called accept, and then the back button, so that we have automatically set those up. And then now let's go into creating those widgets. So for the widgets, we're gonna change actually, again, some project settings to make our life a little easier. We're gonna then go into the widget designer team. We're going to turn on the template selector. So from here, and then instead of grid panel, I'm actually going to change this into a uh, overlay for here. And then I'm gonna remove this vertical box cause we're not actually going to be using it. So I'm gonna just change this order a little by doing it like this. And then for the widget parent classes, I'm gonna change this to common user widget. And then we're also going to add in an activatable widget, which is also shown here. So by default, Unreal Engine uses a user widget, but I wanna use a specific one. You can also enter in your custom ones as well. So just bear in mind that you could do that also. So let's actually go back to our common UI settings and let's go into, I think it's actually here, the common UI editor. So we're gonna enter in our default styles that we want to be using. So I'm gonna be using a button style and a text style that I've already set as such here. We're gonna use the base one as here. I'll showcase them in a moment. So what I have previously set up is that I have a few styles here. So we're gonna go into these two first. The text style, very simple. It's just a text with 40 font and it's black. And for that, I am using a default Unreal Engine one. If you are not seeing the fonts, go into settings and turn on show engine content. And then you will then be able to see the fonts that Unreal Engine provides. If you have your own, you don't need to do this and don't worry about it. And then afterwards I just turn it off because I don't want to see that folder. I like to keep it neat. For the button, I just have some very simple colors that I'm using here. I'm opening them up just in case people want to copy them. And you can just hit pause if you want to specifically copy these colors. And I'm using that for the base, the hovered and the pressed. And then I also set the text to that base style to just keep it nice and simple. I also have a disabled button uh, color, but we're not really utilizing that. So that is also there. And then for the borders, it is the original button tint. And then we also have a pop-up color, which is just a slightly different colored brownish thing. So that is what I have created already. And then within our demo player, we also have a very simple setup of the event begin play. We are creating a widget adding it to the viewport, we will show the mouse and then set to UI only. On top of that, I have a game mode base. And all I do with this is I set the default pawn. It just keeps it very, very simple. Those are the only things that I have set. And then let's go ahead and get into creating these widgets. So we're gonna start with buttons because everything else is gonna need buttons. And then we're gonna create a tab list. And then we're also gonna create a pop-up. The pop-up's gonna take us the most time uh, because there's also gonna be an animation within that. And let's create a widget. And from here, you'll notice that we have our user widget appearing and we also have activatable widget. So our defaults are changed and no longer just says user widget. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a action button first. So these are both gonna be created, but we're gonna start with the action button because a lot of it's gonna be used in the button base. And then now we can select on what default to use. So let's go ahead and create a overlay. We're gonna call this UI and we're gonna call this action base. It's gonna be our action button. We're gonna need a common text. And we're also going to need a common action widget. 
Both of these widgets are required for an action button. I'm not going in full depth on action buttons and on the widgets that I am creating today. I have other videos for this, but this is to showcase the demo as it was requested. All right, so you'll notice if we hit compile that it does require these two things to be named uh, differently. So the text must be called text action name, and then the widget, the common action widget should also be labeled as input action widget. So let's go ahead and make those changes. Text action name. And make that a variable. And we're gonna name this input action widget. And hit compile. Awesome. So super simple. Let's go ahead and change the style to the button base. And we'll notice all the changes that occurred. And then let's also put this in the center. And this should also be centered as well. Perfect. And then when we hit the designer key, let's do like one. We'll notice that it is appearing. So that is super simple. As long as you have the key set up within your uh, controller data, it should appear here. If you don't have a key appearing, it means you didn't set up the controller data correctly. So bear in mind with that. All right. So with this, it's super simple. Let's go back to the action base and we're going to create a width of let's say 300 and maybe about 100. So very simple base. And then let's scroll down. What we need to do is that we want to select display in action bar. An action button is strictly used for adding onto a common action bar, a common bound action bar. So these buttons must be added into there. They cannot be added by themselves. So they do have to be set up a certain way in order to be used. And then you want to do display an action bar. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And with that, uh, you can do like consume pointer input so nothing goes past it or you can stop actions. There's a few other things you could do, but that's all we really need to do for this button. And we don't have to set anything else. So let's go ahead and hit that save button. Uh, and then go into user interface. And we're now going to create our button base. This is going to be the button we're going to be using the most. And from here, we're also wanting an overlay. So we're going to UI button base. We're going to also set that base style. And we're also going to do 300. By 100. We just like to keep that default. And then we're also going to be display in action. Also, you have the ability to hide uh, the input action if they're currently not interactable, as well as you can hide if it is a keyboard. So if you don't want to show keyboard keys, you can turn that on as well. This should use fallback default. Input action is going to default to your click action, or in this case, the accepted input action. So yeah, you can have that turned on, you can have it turn off, whatever you'd want to choose. All right. So now actually, let's go back into the action base. And I actually just want to copy both of these. And we're going to hit paste. And then we're going to change this to just text block. So what it will do is that the common action widget needs to be the exact same name in order to read the action input. Let's actually shrink that a little bit. So you do have to have this specified. It won't give you an error, but you'll also notice frustration. If you don't name it that way, it's just not showing sometimes. So also bear in mind with that as well. All right, let's go ahead and close that out. And for buttons, so typically we want to be able to set the text. So we have that as a variable and we now need to create a Custom event here. We're going to do custom set set button text. And then we're going to grab the text block. Oop. Set text. And we're going to plug that in here. 
So that will automatically set the text. And then we're also going to call the set text, set button text. And we're gonna also promote that to a variable. And we're gonna name that text. Make that exposed as so. And the reason why I created a custom function is because later we're gonna to need to call this function and it's just useful to have that already set up for us. And then we have it just called here and we're also setting the text. So it preps us for the amount of design that we're gonna to need to use. And then from here, we can change this however we want as except. All right, and then for this button, we want to also add a spacer. We're gonna go ahead and add this in and we're going to make the size of 100. And then what we also want to do is we're gonna grab all of these and we're gonna wrap with a horizontal box and hit that fill button. Oh, sorry, not fill. We want this one to hit fill here. So now let's center this. Oop, hello. Fix all of these because for some reason they went out of order and hit fill. And put that back to auto. Hello. Bit of a wonky situation moving back and forth. Uh, we'll put that one back to auto as well. The only one we want set to fill is going to be the center text because we always want it to be in the center. So the reason why we added a spacer is because this input action is also uh, gonna be a 100 by 100 image. So we also want this spacer by 100. I mean, technically speaking, you could do it like 100 by 100 as well. Uh, that's fine too. Now, if you ended up using the don't show upon um, keyboard, so if you wanna hide the keyboard key, what you can do is that underneath the uh, over here, we have input set to variable. You also notice that it's not being shown here. Input action widget. Let's see, on input method changed, what you could do is that under branch, when using gamepad, you can do the spacer. So by making that a variable, grab the spacer, set visibility to collapse. And then you can also do when not using gamepad, oh, sorry, I got it flipped here, to not hit testable, which will essentially have the spacer only appear once the input action is changed to the gamepad. And that is when the icon is actually shown. So you can have that set up uh, I'm going to have the spacer kind of shown at all times, going to be showing both images, but I wanted to just showcase on how you could go about doing that. Okay, so we have both of our buttons set up. Now let's go ahead and create a base widget to hold everything together. So we're going to go into, oops, we're going to go into widget blueprint. We're going to do a activatable widget and we're going to do a canvas panel and we'll do UI main. This will hold everything and we automatically have a canvas showing up here. So now if we grab that button and drag that in, let's do, uh, oh, I thought we set a minimum to it. Did we not do that here? Oh, I guess that is a 300. That can't be right. Yeah, 300 by 100. Odd, but all right. We're gonna center that, do 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then zero, zero. Now let's go ahead and enter in a triggering enhanced input action. This is just gonna set the key and we'll hit accept. And then under our main widget, a few things we gotta do. We're gonna go ahead and turn on is back handling. So it will automatically receive back actions when they are called. We want it automatically activated because we want it to work once we activate it. We want auto restore focus so that whenever it goes back to this widget, we then get focus back. And then upon deactivated, we don't want this to collapse. It is our main widget. We wanna set it to not 
hit testable only. And then for our input mapping, we also want to set this to our IMC UI generic. So this is what we have created and we want that to display there. And for that, when we originally get this widget, we want the desired focus widget to go into our UI button base, which is gonna be the center one. So that is so that our controller actually has a direction to get focus. So let's go ahead and set the text to accept it. As so. And okay, let's see how that is working. Let's go into our demo player. We're gonna then create our main. We should lose, okay and we should never have to touch that blueprint again and hit play. And we'll notice, well, it's being cut off a little bit, probably because I typed accepted and not accept, but when I move my controller, we're seeing the X appear. I move the mouse, we see the enter. So we do have both appearing here and both are working and you're able to click as so. So that is in fact working. Let's go ahead and change the text to just say accept and let's change this to button accept All right so super simple as far as buttons go now let's go ahead and just add in a few more buttons that would be available so we're going to go ahead and wrap this into a vertical box we're going to call this bb button list and then control d two three we're going to change this to back we're going to go ahead and change this to tab left and tab right now let's change all of our text back Tab left, tab right. We're then gonna want to change the alignment because I'm gonna have this actually centered on the left. So we're gonna have over here, we're gonna change the position to 100 and we're gonna change alignment for here to zero. And let's change these to 500 by 500, which is a good amount of space. Let's hit fill for all of these. Sets it just a little better. And then also let's add a padding of like 20. And then for that, they look a bit cleaner here. So that sets up all of those buttons. And then what we also want to do is create one more. This is gonna be outside. And then this is also gonna be a 500 by 500. We're gonna call this one open for that other button that I've created. Let's anchor this to the opposite, negative 100, and we're gonna do zero. Let's change that to one and 0 0.5. So for that, that gives us a nice little setup for here. We're actually gonna be ended up using this open button in the future. So I'm gonna go ahead and just hit that click, click button right now, just to make it a bit easier. And let's go ahead and rename that as well. And then for all of these buttons, I want to select all of them. I want to make sure input action is not set to accept for all of them. So let's remove that. And then display action bar is turned on. We're good. And all of that is set to is focusable. Great. So now we're going to change this to accept. We're going to change this to back. And tab left, tab right. Oop, sorry, this one's tab right. That's tab left, and this one is going to be open. So let's first just take a look that everything is looking correct. And within this button base, also what I want to do is that on the on clicked, what I want is to do a print statement to make sure that we are accurately displaying. So let's go ahead and get the text. And we're gonna do append. 
clicked on space and then put in that text. Just so that whenever I click a button on my controller as well, you can showcase that it is in fact being clicked on. So we're gonna hit play. We notice that all the buttons are appearing. I'm gonna hit R2 right now. So open is being clicked on and you'll notice how it's getting clicked on and I'm not focused on it. And then I'm not focused on the tab left or tab right. So tab left, tab right. And then you also notice when I hit X, it is consuming the input and not actually pressing the open button. So by having accept here, it's consuming that input. If I were to go into here, remove the accept, and now if I press X, I can then click on these buttons. So typically, you don't want the accept or the back button to show here uh, because those are the default ones and they get consumed. So I'm actually going to go ahead and remove both of these and I don't want them available here. But you'll also notice that when I hover on top, you see the X is appearing. And that is because that is our default input, input action. So by showcasing over here in our designer where we are utilizing the, let's see, uh, button base here under should use default fallback input action, it is causing us to then be able to see those available there. So that is how we can use input actions for buttons. So we have both of them set up. Let's go into showcasing the rest. So we're gonna go ahead and close out our button. We have all this set up. We're gonna then create a tab list. So a tab list has two things that we're gonna to need to do. We're gonna to have to create its own widget first. So we're gonna start with that. We're gonna do tab list. Uh, actually, let's do user interface. I think tab list appears here. There we go, and hit select. And then horizontal box, we're gonna UI tab list. And then we have a horizontal box. What we want to set up is the common action buttons. So common action widgets. Copy and paste, control D. And we're gonna name this into left. And we're also gonna name this into right. And this is gonna be our left input action and this could be our right input action. So let's go ahead and set those as well. Where this is gonna be right. This is gonna be left. And then also within the settings of the actual widget itself. So when you're at the highest hierarchy, we want to also set the next and the back. So right is next and left is previous. And then we also want to set to auto listen and also defer rebuilding tab list. And then we're also going to set the display and action bar. I'm not going into in depth into display and action bar right now, but just know that we are having this turned on because we will be showing a common action bar. And then that is all the settings we need to do for this one. Let's also add a vertical box. Uh, sorry, not vertical, a horizontal box. Put that in the center. We're gonna also hit fill and also center it like so. And we're gonna rename this to container. This is going to contain all of our tab buttons. So it is important to have it centered, otherwise you'll have it either just hanging on the left or hanging on the right. Now I'm not going too in depth explaining everything of this widget. This is strictly for demo purposes and showcasing what I did, um, highlighting that especially um, because I have other videos that go in depth into the common tab list. So now a tab list has two events we wanna use. So event handle, it's gonna be event handle tab creation. And then we also want tab removal. So whenever we create a tab, we want to add a button. And then when we remove a tab, we want to remove that button. So from here, we want to do add child to horizontal box. And then we also want to do remove child as well. So upon losing a tab, we want to remove the widget. Upon adding the child, we also want to set the padding. So we're gonna also do 
set padding. We'll split this and we'll also change this to, I think, let's go with five. Five here. And then since we have now created the tab, we also need to make sure that our tab buttons are being created. So let's do this actually. Let's move this over here. And we're gonna do cast to UI button base. Let's just grab another one. Makes it a bit easier here. And now there are better ways to go about doing this, but for demo purposes, I'm doing just casting. There's other ways to set button text and you could go ahead and look at my other tutorials as far as that goes. For demo purposes, we're doing casting just to save some time. And we're also going to set set button text. And we're going to set it to the name ID, like so. So whenever we create this button, we'll now set the button text to whatever the name ID is set. And that will have it nicely contained. So we have all of this. Let's go back into our main. We're going to then add in, add in our tab list to the canvas. We will then fill the top. And what I want to do is I want to fill about 10% and it snaps automatically to 10. And then we're going to hit zero, zero, and it should fill out quite nicely. So it should have the auto listen and the rebuild. It has everything set that we need. Next, we need to add in a switcher. A tab list requires to have a activatable widget switcher or animated switcher or visibility switcher. It needs to have one of those available. Otherwise, you won't be able to flip pages or tabs or whatever you want to refer it as. So let's go ahead. I'm going to rename this to just tab list, keep it neater. And this is going to be renamed to switcher. We're going to anchor this into the direct center. 0 0.5, 0 0.5, because that once again positions it into the center. And we're doing 500 by 500 because that is just the size that we're using in general. All right. So we have the switcher. We have the tab list. So now let's go ahead and create the events to create those. So we're going to make a function. We're going to call it create tabs. And from here, let's make sure we plug this in automatically. It's just going to save us time right now so that we just don't run into any issues along the way. OK. So going into the create tabs, we're going to grab that tab list. From here, we want to go ahead and remove all tabs. So this is just to keep it clear so that whenever this is called, we're never having duplicate tabs. Or for example, using this in the pre-construct, um, pre you're not actually causing like multiple tabs. It just keeps it neat. And then we're also going to set linked switcher. This is the reason why we need that switcher that we created. And we're going to plug that in here. And from here, what we need to do is we now need to create a certain amount of tabs based upon the indexes our switcher has. Now, as of right now, we have nothing in our switcher. So let's actually create those as well. So we're going to go ahead and grab an image. We're going to add this into the switcher. And I'm going to name this. Let's go ahead and just name it one like that and copy paste two, three, four. And we're going to name this to just four and drag that down here. I just like to keep that organized. And we're going to use some pre-made images that I have over in the two, two, let's see, input controller data images here. Okay. I have four images here. We're going to go ahead and add these in. So image one, image two, and three, and four. 
And a bit of a disclaimer, these are AI generated images that I'm utilizing just for demo purposes only. I am not selling these, providing these of any sort. Uh, this is just to give you a better look of things and just wanted to make sure I provided that type of disclaimer for you guys. So let's go ahead and just also let's add a common border here. I wanna add a bit of spacing. So let's go ahead and add a padding of 10 which makes that look a little nice. And then let's also just increase the size to like 520. Just so that the images itself is actually 500 by 500. I just think that kind of cleans it up a little bit. Looks a little nice, er, per se. Okay, so now that we have the switcher, we can go back into here. And within this, let's go ahead and grab the get children count. This will get the total amount of children we have. And let's do a for loop. We're going to then plug that in. And I'm actually just going to change this to one. Now you could just subtract from the children count by one and then go forward with that. But I'm actually going to be using this index for one thing. We do the subtraction later. It's okay. Promote into a variable. We're going to then do an index. From this index, what we want to do is now we are going to create a tab or multiple tabs, I should say. We're going to do register tab, which allows us to create tabs. And then based on this name, what I want is to do, mm, I don't think I could do it from here. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's grab a button base. We'll do the name in a second. I need that switcher again. We're going to do get child at, pull in that index, and now we'll do that subtract one. Plug that in here, move that up a little, plug that in, and then we'll also plug that in. Okay. We're then going to turn this into two string and a pen. We're gonna just give ourselves a small name. We'll just name this item semicolon space and plug that in here. So that gives us our tabs. We get those created super nice and simple. Saved again, making sure to confirm we have everything set here. Let me actually move the order of things a little bit uh, just to make it a little better. We're going to move the button down all the way to the bottom. I don't want you in there. Okay, hold on. Close, close, and we'll do this. There we go. And we're going to name this just switcher border. So once again, we're going to take a look at the demo. Now we'll notice that the alignment is a little odd. We'll fix that in a bit, but just to showcase that we can move around and everything is working. So by doing the R1 and L1, we notice this is moving and it is going through. One thing I want to point out is that you'll notice that when I am clicking R1 and R2, uh, you'll notice that this is not actually being hovered. That is actually an issue with enhanced input actions. So with the input action data, if you use a data table, it works correctly, but not for the enhanced input actions. Again, it's experimental. They are still working on it. So it does require your own workaround. What you would have to do is you would have to set a custom event so that when the tab is clicked on, you set the style to a selected style. It requires kind of a more tedious work. So just bear in mind, you will have to do that. I'm not going into the workaround. Um, I have gone into a similar workaround for mouse keyboard controls, and I have a video on that, which you could take a look, uh, but it would take some time to fill all of that out as well. So as of right now, you will just notice that. So let's also fix that spacing issue. 
Uh, just for the demo, I wanna make sure you guys actually see everything. So I'm moving the alignment here. And then we're also moving this here. There you go. Okay. And that should fix the spacing a lot. Oh, wait, what happened? So once again, it's experimental. I had to restart the editor and then it went back to normal. So it was strictly the editor being a little janky, but that provides us the nice little spacing that we show here. And then we also can show that I can click all the other buttons still left, right is working. And I can go and click on all of these as well as so click on all of these tabs as well. So perfect. Let's now go into creating the pop-up. Now this is gonna take us the most time and we're also gonna work on an animation. I wanna really clarify, I'm gonna create an animation. I'm not gonna go in specific details on everything, but I will show you the keys that I'm entering in and how to utilize it. So we're gonna go into widget blueprint here. We want a activatable widget. And we're gonna do an overlay. We're gonna do UI, pop-up, example. Now this pop-up is going to have two buttons. It's gonna have a print button and it's gonna have a close button. The print button is gonna play a nice little animation and the close button is just gonna remove the widget. So let's also make sure auto activate is enabled. And then we could do is back handler. Uh, and we'll do a display in action and that should be good. All right, so a couple things we're gonna want to add. We're gonna add a blur. So this is just so that when you open up that main widget, we can go ahead and really showcase that this widget is on top. So let's go ahead and go into the main widget. So when adding in a pop-up, we are gonna need to add in an activatable stack. So an act, activatable stack. We're going to add it towards the bottom. We're going to call this a stack. We want to fill it completely, zero, zero. And I'm also going to do a Z order of one. So this just means it will be put on top. Everything else is default to zero. So this will, no matter where it's at in the hierarchy tree, it's going to then go on top. Uh, why did nothing go through? Hit compile, hit compile. There we go. Forgot to hit compile on the other one. And then we notice that there is that blur. So perfect. That is kind of what we want here. Now let's go ahead and build out the center pop-up widget that I want to make. So we're going to go ahead and grab a border, common border. For this border, what we want is we're going to set this to like five. We're going to make that into the center. And then we have our base that it's set, but we want to switch this to pop up. We have a specific color we want to be using. Now let's go ahead and grab a vertical box. This is now going to hold our text as well as our two buttons. So we're going to grab a common text. We're also going to grab buttons. We're gonna add a button. We're gonna have a button. We're gonna name this button print. And this is gonna be button quit. Or no, not quit, close. Highlight both of these. And we're gonna wrap this in a horizontal box. So horizontal, if I have eyes, there we go. And for these, we're going to hit fill. And then we're also going to want to add a little bit of padding. Um, let's see, grab both of these. Maybe a 10 padding is good. That should be all right. And let's actually just do auto. 
because I don't think fill is actually going to apply here. All right. Now I have a small little phrase that I want to be using that I used in the previous video is enhanced input actions can be used in pop-ups. So you'll notice it stretches out a little. So we're going to scroll down. Justification is going to go to the center because we want it to come to the center. And then we're going to turn on auto wrap and we're going to turn this to 500. And that's just so that we can have a nice little thing centered. So that's wonderful. We're also going to want to add a bit of padding. So let's also do a five padding. Just gives it some extra space from everything else. We're going to then copy and paste. We're going to change this and type print was selected. This is going to be used for when our print button is clicked on. We're also going to wrap this in a regular border here. And I forgot to make a style for this one, but it's a nice little red color. And by red, it's kind of like pinkish and stuff. I don't know. I'm not good with colors. Uh, yeah, that's pink. I'm blind. Uh, okay. We're going to rename this to print selected. It's going to be our animated color. It's going to be from here. We're going to change this also to five. Just adds a bit more space. And then let's go ahead and add in our text here. I have these in the wrong order. We'll do print. And we'll also do close. For the print, let's go ahead and add in our print input. And for close, we're also going to add the close input. All right. So this is our generic setup for our print selected. We are going to set this to collapsed. And then if we hit the toggle, we'll notice that it is gone. So that is what it's going to start off with. What we are also going to do is now create an animation. So this is going to make it appear. So let's start with reopening that. We're going to do animations here. Call this print was, or print is, mm, print clicked on. Couldn't decide on a proper name that I wanted. And now we're going to do the print selected. We're going to use the transform. And I'm going to shrink this down to about two seconds. That's all I want to really use here. And then from here, I am specifically going to be using just the translation Y. And I'm going to be using the scale Y as well. So hit that and hit that. The only thing I don't like is that it creates all of these other keys. So I'm going to go ahead and delete it because I won't be using any of it. So we're going to do that. So let's go ahead and go into the one and we're going to do the exact same thing with the two Y's. So I'm only using those. Essentially what I want is that I want this button to start flat. So you see nothing and it just opens up and scales upwards. So I'm going to have it be scaling that. And I also want it to close back down once it's done. So. What we'll do is that under the Y, let's go into setting scale to zero. And then I am going to start it at a lower location of 30. So I already predetermined the size for this, but you can go ahead and use whatever types of things you want here. And then what it will do is it's now going to open upwards like so. So it looks very almost seamless. It's a little odd because it's not perfectly scaling up. I think I kind of need to go probably a little lower. I think I changed maybe something. Let's try like 32. 
35. All right, that's a bit better. Okay, so from here, now this is the center point where it's at its highest, and I now want to decrease everything again. So I'm gonna have to drop this all the way back down to 37 and also to zero. So now we should have a nice little animation of going up and down. Perfect. That's all we want for the animation. We're going to leave that there. And now we're going to go into the graph. Go ahead and close all of this. What I want is that when print is selected, so on clicked, we're going to then do play animation. We're going to grab that print clicked on and then hit compile and then for close what we want to do for this is that when we close this widget we want to then reactivate the previous widget now the simplest way to do that right here is to do find parent of type select self and then we're going to do the main widget this just makes it so that I can locate a widget with no effort. So we're gonna go ahead and go through here and do activate widget, which will then turn this widget back on once we close this. And we'll also do deactivate widget, which will then delete this widget. All right, so now that we have all of that done, the last thing we want to set is to go down to desired focus widget and then we're gonna select the print button so that our controller automatically goes to the print button. And these are the two things that are focusable is these two buttons. All right. So with that, we now have our pop-up. If we go to none and then put pop-up. All right, so looks like missing something here. No, it is collapse. I just have to hit that I button. Go ahead and do that. Huh, wonder why it's there. Well, let's showcase to see if everything is working as intended. We hit that, oh, we actually missed something. For our open button that we created before, we have yet to actually create the pop-up. So let's go ahead and do that here. We're gonna go ahead and grab our stack. We're gonna do push widget. And then we'll do the pop-up example. And from here, if we hit open, we'll then be able to see that this appears here. If I use the controller, we hit print. Oh, looks like I'm clicking on it, but nothing is happening. And if I hit close, that happens. So let's go back over here, go into the graph. So button is clicked on. And ooh, let's do restore state. And one thing, let's see, I think I missed is that this is set to collapse. And what we need to do is actually track the visibility. So visibility here, it should become not hit testable. Okay. And that way, when I'm not doing animations, it should go back to being collapsed. And lastly, let's go into the pop-up example and then let's go ahead and just change this to visible. I believe this is the issue because we need something to actually be able to block the input. So we go into here and then let's open this up. Yep, and we'll notice that everything is being blocked. And then if I hit triangle, we're being able to play that animation and then square to close it. I'm able to navigate all the way through here with my controller and then R1, L1 to flip through, R2 to reopen, and yeah. So we have all of that playing perfectly. So we have all that set up. And now last but not least is just the action bar, which is honestly not much that we actually need to do here. We'll add this to the canvas. We're then gonna anchor this to the bottom. We're gonna do the exact same thing. Let's scale that to 10%. 
and it should snap. There we go. And then we'll do zero, zero, and zero. So we have that fill out perfectly. And this is where we enter in that action base button that we created. Let's give it a nice little spacing. We'll hit that fill button and hit compile. And then we should be good here. So if we hit play, we'll then notice that we have all of those show up there. Now, we'll notice only three buttons are appearing and that is because the action bar will only appear with actions with widgets that are actually meant to display an input action. Since our accept and back, we removed it. So we don't have those available. If we were to hit open, you'll notice that it actually shows open, print and close all up here there. It's because we're using all of them, including the back button. So that is how the action bar works. I'll have a, its own video, but we do show that everything is actually working exactly as intended. And like so, we can go ahead and close all of it. And lastly, the thing I wanna go over is to showcase how you can use the enhanced input actions while still in your player controller or player character and have it interact with the UI still. Now I'm gonna do it kind of in a horrific way, but that's just to showcase that it can be done. I didn't set this up in order to specifically showcase like abilities or something from like games, but you will see that you can connect it and utilize it that way. So in order to do that, we have to first go into the metadata here and we're gonna be showcasing with the print and we're gonna be able to play this animation within our player character. So in order to do that, you have to turn off is generic input Generic input action will consume the input action for buttons and UI. So if it is turned off, that it allows the player character to call the um, input action and use it within itself or player character, things like that. So in order to have this go through and not used in the UI, you have to turn it off. So now that it is off, we can go into our player character. So let's go back over here, blueprints, demo player, and we'll do I UI print. And then from the started, I'm just going to do a print statement as of right now, and we'll do print activated. So very simple. And if we go into the level, what I'll do is I'm going to press triangle. And you'll notice absolutely nothing is happening here. And that's because there is no button on this screen that is currently using the print enhanced input action. So unless there is some type of UI that is utilizing it, it's not going to do anything. So what we can do is that when we hit R2 to open up the pop-up, we then have the print available. So if we hit triangle, we're then getting print is activated, but no animation is playing. And that's because we're now using it from our player controller that it no longer activates the click on uh, button. It now just says, okay, well, we are using the button, but we're not doing anything yet. So the button is available, but we have to choose to do something. And this is where it gets kind of horrific. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the pop-up so that I can play the animation. Uh, so I'm gonna do get all actors of class. We're gonna then do the pop-up. Oh, oh, sorry, not actors of the class. Uh, get all widgets of class. We're gonna turn off top level and we're gonna do pop-up. And we'll just do loop. And I guess we could do like an is valid, but granted, I'm not really doing this in a specific way. And then now within our pop-up, let's go back over here and let's create a custom event. And we'll do play print animation. Go back to our demo player and we'll do print play animation. So again, very horrific, don't do this. There are significantly better ways to do that that I've showcased in like all of my videos. All right, so let's go into here. We'll hit R2 and we'll hit triangle. So like that, we're able to communicate with the UI and exactly what's happening. I can then re-trigger this over and over again. 
And like so, you can have the enhanced input action work within your player controller. So if you were to do like spells and abilities, you could then have a trigger where after it started to send a message to the UI and have like a cooldown happen or whatever it is. So you'd be able to set up along the lines of that. So with that, that does give us a full demonstration of how to utilize the input actions within UI, how to get everything working. And like so, we're able to actually go all the way through. I mean, the bar shows all of the images and buttons of that we're currently using. So we can actually click on those too. Uh, so if I were to actually go down and select on open, it does actually open. So these buttons are clickable. You can choose to not make them clickable as well if you just want them visible. But that is enhanced input actions. If you appreciated this tutorial, please hit the subscribe button, join the memberships. I upload my videos there early and I always shout out all of my members as well. So have a great rest of your day.